Joining me on the podcast today is Chris Seller, an aviation expert with decades of experience in navigating and implementing technology changes to meet the changing needs of travel. As Australia moves towards the opening of international borders, our thoughts are turning to what international travel will look like and how it will take place. Facing a world at different vaccination levels, differences in vaccine recognition, a myriad of rules on quarantine, and the ever-present question of travel security. What does the future of travel look like in a post-COVID environment? And how does technology and infrastructure need to change to make it happen? Chris Seller, welcome to the Smarter Cities podcast and to the DXC studio here in Sydney. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me and lovely to talk to you today. It's great to see you. It's, it's been a fascinating period of time here in Sydney. We're uh, at the end of our lockdown period, hopefully out uh, very soon. And I think we're seeing a new wave of optimism coming over us. You were just telling me about life on the beaches. It sounds to me you want to get rid of people from, from where you are. <laughs> I want everybody back in the office as soon as possible. Well, look, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of travel. I noticed today Qantas gearing up very much, saying their planes are going to be ready uh, to fly. And I think a lot of us who have been you know, used to travel and a lot of people who are used to, to Australians traveling have found this last couple of years quite taxing, sort of not being able to leave or see family interstate, let alone internationally. So I think it's a really important time to be talking about how airports and technology and infrastructure is going to cope. So it's, it's great to have you here. But let's start with you. I usually start these podcasts with a bit of, you know, why a person becomes an expert in a particular area. So you've had a fascinating career. I'm very keen to understand what got you into this? How did you end up as an aviation expert? Well, interestingly, I didn't actually start in aviation. My first uh, job when I left school was uh, a cut, as a cartographer. Oh, really? And uh, I wasn't very good at it. And uh, the um, insight that I got during that period in how technology could change the way work gets done uh, got my interest in technology going. Cartography was a mix of art and technical uh, aspects and the technical side of, the, of that activity um, I could see being very quickly replaced by uh, uh, computation and, and uh, computers. So I went off and did my computer science degree. Uh, and uh, during that uh, period of time, I answered an ad in, uh, in one of the, the, the papers uh, for, to, for a company that was looking for uh, somebody with a cartographic background and uh, computer science. It was pretty uh, serendipitous. Um, that company was uh, Data General, uh, and uh, they don't exist anymore but I worked with them for about five years as a software engineer building software for um, geographic information systems. Wow, okay. Um, that, uh, when they folded, I then, uh, through my contacts at university, joined Westpac. Uh, and uh, that started my, um, the part of my career which was in finance and banking. Um, it's interesting going into that sort of environment because banks have very large scale technology um, systems, uh, high transaction volumes, lots of customers and that sort of thing. So the, the, the challenge in that environment is scale. Um, towards the end of uh, the 90s, I, I moved across to, um, to Qantas. One of my um, colleagues at, at Westpac had, had gone across to uh, Qantas and, and I followed them. And uh, the similarities between the systems was, was, was quite remarkable. Again, between banking and aviation. Yeah, yeah, just the you know from a technical perspective, large scale technology, high transaction volumes, distributed systems. Um, uh, but that really was when aviation got into my blood. Uh, and I worked at Qantas for about 15 years. Had a lot of very interesting roles there. In fact, I was part of the team that's uh, set up Jetstar uh, in the uh, in the mid 2000s. And that was when I really got to understand how aviation worked, and and you got to see the foundations of a of a new airline, what went into thinking about how networks worked, and and how technology supported the business, in, in and particularly from the economics of it. Um, I left Qantas um, in, in uh, I think it was 2011, um, after I'd sort of reached the role of, uh, of the chief uh, technology architect uh, and went back to Westpac. And I uh, spent another five years at Westpac um, and got to see how things in that 15 years had changed with technology, how technology had advanced. Cloud computing had become a big thing. 
uh, automation was much more um, uh, on, the, on the agenda uh, and mobile computing and other, other impacts on, on the way uh, the technology systems at banks worked. Um, I then uh, uh, left Westpac in I think 2016 uh, and uh, took up a role in Canberra with um, the nation's air traffic control organisation, Air Services, as their CIO. Uh, and spent uh, the better part of five years working there, getting a very good understanding and grounding in how the air side of the of the industry worked. Because mm, you mattered, that's right, you would have seen both sides then. So I've seen it all. I've seen the yeah. airline, I've seen the airport, and I've seen the airspace management. So I've had it's a funny. It's funny, I was listening to a, a discussion today about um, a guy who is the biography of Peter Thiel, who came up with um, PayPal and Palantir. And one of the the great statements, the you know, famous statements Peter Thiel had made was, you know, if you look at air travel, we really haven't progressed at all in terms of airspeed since the 50s and 60s. In fact, the average speed uh, of, of airlines has slowed. And that's true. You know, we don't have Concorde anymore, for example, right, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, but to say then that technology hasn't evolved in aviation actually isn't correct, because if you think about it, Air travel in the 50s and 60s was almost unaffordable for the average person, whereas today it is very affordable, at least it was pre-pandemic, very affordable. You can travel on a Jetstar, you can travel internationally in economy uh, for a very competitive price, and that is due to technology. One of the, the big pandemic issues is, I suppose, how what was becoming an increasingly connected and uh, an accessible world through travel has now been stopped because of um, border closures and um, in, you know, for quite legitimate reasons to stop the, the spread of the disease, which none of us have in any recent time experienced before. I think aviation has probably been the most impacted by COVID than perhaps any industry. Um, and I think the, the steering image I have in my mind um, is the last time I traveled internationally was to Hong Kong last March and landing into, um, into Cheplak Kok there were just planes parked everywhere on runways and they were ahead in the COVID, um, uh, the, the COVID experience before we were in Australia. And it was at that moment I realised sort of how much trouble we were really going to be in when I could see all these planes parked everywhere. What's been the impact on the industry? I mean, you've, you've been <coughs> watching it closely, you've worked both sides. What's been the impact and is it a lasting impact, do you think? Well, the, in the industry's suffered many um, sudden shocks. Uh, you know, since its inception over 75 years ago. And basically the industry's made no money in that time. It, uh, it's a very difficult uh, industry to, uh, you know, to, to, to make a profit. Um, I think there were some, some uh, stats that came out recently from uh, the International Air Transportation Association, who represents as a lobby uh, organisation, that re represents the, the world's um, airlines. Uh, and to, to put a sort of dollar uh, figure on it, they're, they're estimating that in 2021, the, the, the global air, uh, aviation industry will lose about 40 billion US dollars compared to tw globally. 2019 globally. So it is a, it's, it's, a, it's been a, a, a significant downturn and uh, you know, the airlines are, are really struggling. Every aspect of the industry is struggling. If passengers aren't flying, airports aren't earning money, airlines aren't earning money, you know, they, they, um, uh, it's an impact on staff, it's an impact on everybody. Um, and, the, and I think this current downturn has been worse than we've ever experienced. SARS was difficult, 9-11 was, was, was very difficult, but um, the COVID impact has been more protracted and uh, has had a greater impact than any of those. But, but people and the industry uh, are very resilient and it tends to bounce back pretty quickly. Uh, so when the opportunity comes to fly again, it, people will want to get back on an aircraft. I mean, I know myself that I'm very keen to get to, back to the, the UK and see my daughter. Mm. Uh, so the first opportunity I get to get back on a plane, I will. Um, and my wife works in the, um, in, the, in the luxury cruise industry, and they're seeing very, very strong forward bookings for, mm, for, for cruising. Uh, out. Another industry very impacted by, by very, the, very tourism impacted. generally. Yeah. Very, very impacted. I mean, it's interesting. I think you don't realize how important something is to you until you don't have it anymore, right? Yeah. And so I think uh, domestic travel, uh, international travel, the ability to go anywhere in the world quickly, for many people, it's been a shock. Uh, to not have that available to yep. them anymore. And you see 
Europe opening up and you know, certainly my, my colleagues in, in America telling me they're going city to city and how grateful they are to be doing it. After a period of time when those of us in business travel were like, oh my goodness, I've got to get on a plane again. I don't think anyone will be complaining for a while yeah. being able to go and visit people. And I, yeah. I do think it, it's interesting that in the early stage of the pandemic, when we all went on to video conference and started engaging with, it, with one another that way, there was a, a period of novelty, I think, with that. And now more and more people I speak to are saying, you know, I miss the actual human interaction of speaking to one another, meeting one another, having dinner with one another. Yeah. Because that's how you create new things. I think generally yeah. that's how you create new things. So I certainly think we, as we look from an Australian perspective at you know, our, uh, how things are going in the UK and in Singapore and in America and how they're learning to live with this virus. So that's, that's certainly a pathway we're going to be going on. Travel is going to play a big role in that. Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely the leisure travel industry will, will return pretty quickly. I think it's interesting, though, from a business perspective. I think businesses have actually learnt to use remote t technology and remote Definitely. working, and and I, I don't see business travel coming back at at the same pace, if ever. Um, and I think yeah. uh, what we've learnt with you know technologies like Zoom and WebEx and that sort of thing is that we can remote uh, work very successfully, and businesses can can sustain that that, that sort of technology. Uh, over long periods. I so agree. I think, you know, particularly when, you know, you, the, the normal corporate travel argument is over three hours or whatever it is, it's business class. And the business class fare is three times what an economy class fare is. You know, yeah. why would I need to spend that unless, yeah, yeah. I, unless I really need that travel? So it goes back to your question around the financial sustainability of the airline industry, which uh, it's fascinating, really. I mean, one of the arguments I've, I've read about the aviation industry is there's too much competition in the, in the sector, which is sort of competing away all the profits. And part of the reason is that you have state-run airlines and state-propped-up airlines, which carry a national significance and national importance, and therefore they are protected industries. And so therefore you have protected airlines versus you know, sort of market-competing airlines. Um, and, and that sort of ends up competing away all the profit, which is um, probably not one for this discussion, but uh, a fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. I, the structure of the, of the industry is a very interesting one. It's another podcast. Though. It certainly is. <laughs> it certainly is. That's a good segue. Let's go into, into post-COVID world. So, you know, we're all looking forward to opening up and, uh, and travel. So I was thinking about this on the way here. It seems to me that the, the technology aspects of travel and the technology aspects of infrastructure always seem to be reactive. Right. So, you know, with the tragedy of 9-11, we saw intense security, you know, body scanning equipment. I remember the whole debate in Australia about this sort of really intense body scanning being very, very important. And we put that in. You saw that all over U.S. airports, you know, with SARS. You know, I'm, I'm from Hong Kong originally. SARS was a, a big deal. We had integrated temperature checking everywhere in most Asian airports. Um, you know, ac across Hong Kong in particular and China, at railway stations, you had this as well. It's not just, just airlines. What, what do we think the reaction to COVID is going to be? What's the, you know, I definitely think there's going to be an overreaction because the airline, airline industry doesn't want to be shut down again. The cruise ship industry, the railway industry, no one wants to be shut down again. Are we going to overreact again? What is it? Are we going to overbuild? Well, I think it's interesting you mentioned the 9-11 um, scenario because I don't know if you remember but at, at that at the same time in Australia here ANSEC failed yes and we had a double whammy uh, the industry was really hard hit uh, Qantas was rep repatriating uh, ANSEC customers from all over the place uh, we had uh, major shutdowns in the industry in the US and Europe uh, and, and it had a long um, lasting effect, uh, subdued the capacity in the industry for quite some time. Interestingly, in, in uh, 2007, I was at a, at a technology conference, aviation technology conference in, uh, in the US, and Colin Powell, the former Secretary of State, was uh, a keynote speaker. And he gave his um, assessment of what has had occurred uh, in the US aviation industry and he said when he was in, in uh, the administration he uh, had to mandate changes to the way security worked in US airports and at the time it didn't impact him personally because he would have special 
you know, entourages that would, mm. that, that would sort of whisk him through the yeah, airport. He's not the sort of guy that would line up at a And, and he didn't airport. have to line up. But when he became a private citizen, he said it, he was shocked at the impact that those changes had, had made to the industry and how difficult it was for people to get through the airport um, security check experience and the, and the long delays that had occurred and the disruption that had occurred. And at the time he said what he was hoping that technology would be, would drive a more efficient, more frictionless uh, process for, for passengers in an airport. Maintain the security and safety aspects, mm. but, but do that in a more efficient way. And I think the industry has been working on that ever since 9-11. You roll forward to where we are at COVID, a lot of that work has suddenly become very urgent again. And, uh, and that's what we're actually seeing. And I think that's what we're going to see post COVID. You're going to see a lot of that investment in R&D in innovative ways of managing passengers through airports and through the travel experience start to, to come into play. And we're actually seeing it now in, in many of the airports globally. What, so what, let's, let's go into some specifics. What, what do you think will happen? How will the travel sort of experience change? So I remember, for example, being traveling around the US um, you know, around around just after 9-11 happened, a couple of years after. And it was, you're right, it was a ter terrible experience. You know, I, I looked on my boarding pass. I had a particular mark on the boarding pass. I'd been randomly selected yep. for specific checks. Um, and it was a very manual check. You know, they come and check you, they check your bag, whatever. It wasn't really a lot of technology involved. You still had the, the body scan thing, which was not available in all US airports at that point. But... From a technology perspective, you know, there's been a lot of R&D around all of this, and there will be a desire to keep air travel as sort of um, open as possible. Are there particular things you, you envisage are going to come in to change the way we do this? Yeah, I think um, we're, we're seeing them now. So the, the, the big areas of, uh, of change will be around biometrics to, you know, for uh, passenger identification and contactless servicing in, in, in the aerodromes. So what we're seeing is enormous amount of effort being put into uh, building the, the capability for uh, governments, airlines and airports to, to use biometrics to identify passengers at scale uh, and, and get them through the airport uh, experience w in, in a paperless way. So is that, what is that, a fingerprint? Uh, a, facial recognition, facial so recognition. facial geometry, iris, Iris scanning, wow. facial geometry. It's mainly facial geometry is, is, a, is a technology. So it they use. scans you at the beginning yep. and then it scans you at the other side or, yep. or does it scan you through? Well, at various waypoints through, through mm. the airport. As you, right. as you go into the terminal, you'll probably get scanned. Uh, you know, there is a number of airports that are doing it. Doha, for instance, does that. Um, you know, they look for uh, people that shouldn't be coming into the airport, mm. you know, people with records and that sort of thing that they don't want there. Uh, then, then as you start to progress your way through, you drop your bags, you do your check-in, uh, you know, it uses facial recognition, biometric facial recognition, uh, and, and sort of it eliminates the need for, for the use of paper documentation like passports. Well, I was going to say, do you need a passport then, right? The, the problem the, currently, the problem is that, that if you're in a geography or, or, or a country where that has become the, the norm, mm. then it works really well. But at On your arriving end, yeah. Uh, yeah. airport, if they don't have the same capability, that, that's uh, where it becomes problematic. Yeah. And I want to get to that. Um, but before we get off the technology response, like, what about touch? So obviously you've got facial recognition that will get you through each way. If you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, prior to the sort of alpha variant, um, I don't remember all my variants, but I remember the first thing was, you know, you've got to sanitize your hands, right? Yeah. Um, that's a big deal. Don't touch anything, right? Then, you know, masks became mandatory in most places beyond public transport, for example. Yep. Do you think those things, I mean, those are not technology solutions, but do you think those are permanent features of airports now in terms of hygiene, cleanliness to avoid, yeah. you know, Yeah, I think that they will be, they'll definitely be um, uh, permanent features. The, um, uh, there are a number of airports that are deploying uh, uh, thermal uh, monitoring, uh, fever monitoring. Uh, I mean, it's almost a mandatory at airports yeah. now to, to yeah. check people's temperatures as they, as they work their way through the airport. Um, th that sort of technology will become a permanent, a permanent feature. Hopefully it doesn't, 
raise too many alarms in a post-COVID world. Most people hopefully will be healthy and, and, and get work their way through the airport experience relatively unscathed. But uh, that definitely will be a permanent feature. Kiosks that do... So, I mean, I remember in SARS, you, if you had a high temperature, you were sent to a room. Fortunately, I wasn't one of these people, but somebody I was travelling with was. Uh, and you had to wait for a few hours until, and then they kept temperature checking you until you, they were sure you weren't suffering from something. Yeah. Is that what we're looking at in a COVID scenario? Yeah, yeah well, it's interesting. quarantine rooms? Or, you know, yeah, I think, I think that, that is, that, that's an option. Uh, you could be di- denied entry to the airport sent away. Um, it's interesting, Istanbul Airport's doing a lot of very interesting things. They, they actually are now doing rapid COVID testing. So if mm. you show up at the airport, you're not a vaccinated uh, passengers, you haven't, can't produce uh, a, a recent uh, a negative test result, they'll do it on the spot. Right, so and using rapid antigen. Yeah, rapid something. antigen testing. And, and they, they can apparently do about 12,000 tests a day. They're almost a pathology uh, lab wow. in their own right now. So mm. that, that will become uh, you know, the norm in, in, in the post-COVID world. So think of it, thinking it through, I mean, you're looking at Qantas, for example, saying you must be vaccinated to travel. You have a COVID certificate that, you know, as Australians, we all have on our phone now, um, which is a great innovation. Um, does that mean now they might actually end up testing you before you get on the aircraft? I mean, the US is quite strict about things. Remember, you have an extra security check if you're on a US flight. I wonder whether you might actually get a, a rapid antigen test going onto a plane internationally. That's well, possible. that could happen. It's, a, it's an expensive process for the airports and the airlines to do that. I mean, they would, they, you, you, would, you would think that they would sort of push that back to the passenger to, to, to do that to themselves, do themselves before they yeah. arrive. And the last thing you want is someone arriving at an airport that's COVID positive. Um, but, but that sort of thing will, will, will start to but appear. But it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. Yeah. You are going to get COVID pa- yeah. positive passengers. I mean, you, yeah. you think of the case numbers overseas are still substantial, right? Uh, yeah. In the thousands per day. We, we are less worried about them because of the high levels of vaccinations in some of these yep. places. But, and you know, I, I don't want to speculate, but in Australia, while our case numbers are where they are right now, as we begin to open up, they will inevitably rise. Yep. Um, and so, you know, in the current world we live in, if you have a COVID positive case, pretty much you close ranks around it, but you can't possibly do that if you know, you're, you're an airport, you can't close yeah. down every few minutes. You, you raised the cost structure here, which I think is fascinating about this, because I remember when we went through the, the security uh, era after, after 9-11, there was a big debate about who pays for all this airport infrastructure that the government effectively as the regulator of airport security was putting into place. And the airports were passing that on to the airlines. The airlines inevitably had to pass it on to the consumer but there was a, of course, there was a price elasticity of demand for um, airline tickets. So the higher they became, the less people demanded them. And so all of a sudden, airlines ended up being on the receiving end of losing money because they had high airport access fees, high airport security payment fees. They were also paying for quarantine offices. They were also paying for, you know, whatever else. Do we think that the cost structure of airport infrastructure is going to change substantially again now with with COVID technology? Do you see that happening? And do you think the airlines are going to be part of that solution or will they fight back? Uh, it's, it's always been a tension between the airlines and the airports. <laughs> that's why but, I asked the question. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, uh, you know, it is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one to predict. Or, uh, you know, definitely the costs will rise um, in, some, uh, in some way as the airports have to implement these new technologies. I mean, contactless uh, technologies in an airport is going to require a, a quite a bit of uh, refit activity and, and you know, they're going to have to remove their old technologies, their old uh, baggage handling systems, their old kiosks and replace them with systems that, that, that don't require any touch. Um, mm. you know, biometric cameras, uh, you know, um, contactless RFID kind of Remember the online check-in that you know, used yep. to go? That's all gone, right? Yeah, you yeah. can't have that yeah, anymore. You can't have that anymore. So, so definitely there will be a, a cost of refit. Um, some of the airports, you know, they'll just absorb that as part of their infrastructure renewal. Mm. Um, but, it, but it's always a tension between the, you know, the, the cost of the fulfillment part of the transaction for the customer. So the customer's uh, relationships with an, air, with an airline, they buy a seat 
to go somebody somewhere and yeah. the, the fulfillment aspect of that happens in, in, in the airport. And uh, you know, it's always been that, that tension that the, you know, the, the airline wants to have the cheapest fare possible and the cheapest experience through the airport as possible. But the airport is the fulfillment end of the transaction and they need to provide that hygiene um, uh, guarantee for their pas passengers and provide the right technologies for their passengers. Why does the cost structure for the airport, why, does the, why is the tension so much more evident in some jurisdictions than others. So if I take a, an example of uh, Chepla Kok in Hong Kong or Changi in Singapore, these are very, very advanced airports. They're constantly renewing. Uh, you know, I noticed Hong Kong put out a statement the other day saying their air conditioning system is now carbon free, or I think I got that right. Um, so there's constant investment going on. And then you compare that with, say, some American airports, which are, you know, very difficult to get through and, you know, are clearly very old or, you know, why is the cost structure different in some jurisdictions than others? Well, I think it's just a scale thing. You know, it's, a, it's the volume of traffic that goes through the airport. Mm. Uh, it's also the, the way the government sees their, their yeah. airports. I think it's that investors. way, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's a, often a brand thing, uh, particularly some of the Asian airports like Changi and, and Hong Kong. Uh, you know, just look at Doha Airport, yeah. I mean, which is yeah. it just won the, uh, the, the 2021 uh, Star Trek uh, Airport of the Year award. Uh, it, it's phenomenal. Yeah, uh, well. The investment they put into that airport is, is, is well beyond what you'd imagine the economics of it. And then you compare that to LAX and you're and like, you compare yeah. to LAX. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I try to avoid LAX. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Um, so I, I think that is really going to be one of the interesting facets of airport infrastructure generally. Because there's really three elements, isn't it? There's the first is getting to the airport part. Yeah. You know, in, in Australia, we've spent a lot of money on, on the getting to the airport part. You know, in Sydney, we've got, uh, you know, the West Connects motorway and the gateway being built now to get to the airport faster. Melbourne, you know, we finally have an airport rail link being built because we're recognising that Australian cities need excellent connectivity to their ports in order to be an internationalised city, in order to be a trading nation. The same goes, you know, we're talking about airports here, and you know, I notice our background here of a, of a terminal building, which I think is Heathrow. Um, but uh, the same goes for ports, right? Whether, you know, you'd look at the Port Botany rail line duplication right now, all to make sure we get, you know, the flow of people, goods and services happening more often. And I just find the whole governmental overlay of this in terms of investment quite, quite interesting, because you're right. Some jurisdictions pride themselves on being a high quality infrastructure nation like uh, Singapore or, or Hong Kong or Tokyo and others like the United States have sort of decided that that's not actually uh, a priority and there are other things that are a priority. Now, of course, now you see President Biden talking about a three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill. But only some of that is actually for hard economic infrastructure. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. it's just a really interesting, really interesting debate that I think is coming. Yeah, yeah, and and that um, I think the post-COVID world will actually drive a lot of that investment, just through the necessity of people have to be uh, moving around in a in a in a hygienic environment. Mm -hmm. You can't have the old technology uh, providing that kind of uh, that that kind of service. Just like uh, 9/11 created the security. Uh, uplift in all the American airports. COVID will create the hygiene and the and the health uplift that's required in all of the airports globally. Uh, it'll be mandated by governance. Will be mandated and re and and, and, and required and required by cus uh, by passengers. But inevitably, will drive the cost up. In and it'll inevitably drive the cost up yeah. to some extent. That's I mean, one of the interesting things I've been thinking about as well is what is the relationship between primary infrastructure and secondary infrastructure and. The first place I went to was, well, there won't be a need as much for secondary infrastructure because the cost structure will be higher, people will travel less, there will be a psychological safety question around, is it safe to travel? Um, and so maybe you'll find some smaller airports, smaller train area, train ports falling away. Yeah. Um, and then I sort of start to think, well, actually, is that really the case? Because I think one of the things we're seeing now is we moved from, we, are, we were pre-pandemic, a highly globalized, highly integrated world where our supply chains were almost just in time. And you started to see as the pandemic bit, you know, chip supply questions. Oh my goodness, we don't have enough chips, you know, semiconductors. Then mm. it was like, 
raw material questions. You know, car plants had to close down. Now in the UK, you've got <coughs> energy questions that are happening. You know, they can't get fuel into the UK um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is the pandemic. And so there is this idea now that maybe as the world adjusts to this post-COVID environment, we're moving from what was a just-in-time supply chain to a just-in-case supply chain, which then means the relationship of airports, and we've talked largely about passengers here, but airports, ports, railways actually changes completely now to being one more integrated with the supply chain. Is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, I think that's, um, uh, from an airport context, that, that, that's a, it's an interesting concept. I think uh, if you think about the supply chains, one of the things that, that sort of worries me a little bit about supply chains is the fuel, um, the amount of fuel that we store here in Australia. It's, you know, something like 20 days of, of, I know. of aviation fuel. I know, it's frightening. It is, is, it's a frightening scenario. And, and, and then our strategic fuel reserve is stored in the United States. Yeah. Which I've never really And we, we actually don't even comply with our treaties with the US when it comes to, that there's a requirement for us to, to store a certain amount of fuel. Uh, which we don't do because we use that just-in-time uh, fuel mm. out of out of Singapore. What has been? What is the reasoning behind that? Why? I mean, given the given the size of our country, we have space to have a strategic fuel reserve. What stopped us from? Well, doing I don't this? know what's that stopped. It's a, you know, it's something I don't think gets enough, enough attention. Yeah, and it hasn't been a problem. Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, until yeah. you know, probably even with COVID, we haven't really experienced a fuel problem here in Australia. I think if we have a you know, a bit of a dispute somewhere in the South China Sea, that might change people's opinions about yeah. how that gets handled. It's quite topical at the moment, really, isn't yeah. it? You know, I do think, I mean, it's, it's funny, John Anderson uh, on his podcast um, has been talking about this issue a lot, you know, interviewing yep. different military, former military personnel and whatever yep. else, raising it as an issue, because I actually think it, it doesn't have to be a, um, an act of war or, or something else that disrupts the supply yep. chain. In this case, it's a health emergency that disrupted the supply chain. And in the case of the UK, um, that could happen here, right? Yep. There's something that's happened in the UK that's caused fuel, sh uh, fuel shortages. They are now suffering as a consequence of it. And the Prime Minister is saying the problem will be solved by Christmas. So they're going to be in this sort of period of time with you know, sort of higher energy prices till Christmas. Yep. I just can't imagine I know, the public are going to respond to that. They're, yeah, yeah. They're, not, well, not, they're not going to be happy. And it's not just in it's not just in Europe. I mean, you've, uh, in in the UK, China is support uh, is now experiencing energy shortages as well, right? Mm. For a different set of factors. Yeah. So I think you know a lot of this then comes back to the freight and logistics supply chain where airports play this big role. And yeah. you know, I know there's going to be a change in the cost structure and how passengers move. I'm convinced there will be a freight implication here as well. And I haven't quite thought through what that is yet. Yeah. But I think there is definitely a technology element to that too, yeah. as to how all of that gets managed. Yeah. Um, and airports are going to have to understand that and freight and logistics operators are going to have to understand that. Yeah, well, freight and cargo for an airport is a very Im important revenue stream. Uh, is it true airlines make most of their money out of cargo rather uh, than passengers? Well, I don't think so. it's most of their money, but they can make a lot of money out of, out of, their, uh, out of their cargo. Um, I mean, it's when I was at Qantas and I used to travel in, in staff travel, I used to dread being tapped on the shoulder and being asked to leave the plane <laughs> because there was a weight, uh, weight and fuel balance yeah. and they needed uh, to pick a couple of staff members to get off. Yeah. Probably carrying a few lobsters Price in the belly. Price travelling free, my friend. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. But is it, if, we, if we come back just to, to the airport environment in a post-COVID world, one of the things, particularly with that, the economics of how the airports operate, well, there's some, some technology developments that are happening to help them optimise how the airport actually operates. Um, you know, recent advances with you know, the way data can be stored, so big data, volumes of data, and how it can be analysed in real time is giving the airport operators some, some opportunities to, to think about how the asset of the airport, the, the terminal asset, the, the runway asset, etc., can, can be used uh, to its greatest um, utility. Um, things like the creation of a digital twin, which is a mm. virtual uh, image of the airport in operation at any time. So they can manage social distancing, for instance, of people. They can manage the flow of passengers through the airport in real time by watching a digital replica of the actual operation in an airport and adjusting the, how their resources are deployed, how many gates they've got open, 
where they send their teams to for, you know, for various tasks and things in an airport. That's a very interesting uh, is, technology. Is that in use now in airports? It's, it's, it's yeah. in use. In fact, DXC has done some extensive work in Hong Kong uh, oh, okay. to prototype uh, a digital twin over there. So they're, they're looking at uh, potentially up to 40% operational improvement in Hong Kong. Which and, is and that comes from optimising resource use, optimising optimizing personnel use. And doing it in real time. But the data that they capture in real time, they can then use for historical analysis. So they could go back and say, well, you know, where do we, how could we drive greater uh, efficiency in the way the airport operates by looking at how they've performed in the past? It, it, it really gives them a, a huge advantage. The ability to store that sort of data, which is some of its video data, some of its you know, smart sensors, et cetera, they've got deployed around the airport, creates very large data sets that, uh, that, that in today's technology allows them to store them relatively cheaply and process them very, very rapidly. Mm. So they can start to predict about how the airport should operate um, in, in, in the future, but they can also do it real time on the day of operations to make sure the airport is, is operating in, in the most efficient way, which in a, in a post-COVID world is going to be very important. New York, has, uh, JFK, has just implemented some video processing technology that that um, helps them maintain social distancing. So oh, they wow, can really? see where passengers are dwelling, where they're getting to, uh, dwell times are, uh, are too long. They can then send out somebody to, to do dispersal activities and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, use of this sort of, um, mm. this sort of analytics. Well, I'm hoping we'll see the end of social distancing eventually. Uh, you know, that's, uh, but anyway, that is like, Let's the digital twin element is fascinating. I and mean, I've really sort of seen it come, um, come up in so many different sectors, you know, I, mean, I, I work in, in the property and construction sector, um, you know, uh, and the digital twin for buildings is becoming amazing to see the sort of level of detail you can do and the scenario testing in how you construct a building. And I've sort of seen a, a number of, of applications of this in, in airports as well. Like I, I know Certis in Singapore is doing something similar with the, yep. the digital twin. And I think the cost structure element of it um, in terms of if, if we are going to face rising cost pressures in airport infrastructure or port infrastructure, technology has to be the key to fix some of the operating costs of the airport, if not the construction costs of the airport in the first place. I mean, these things aren't cheap to build and they have very, very long lifespans. And if you have an international incident like we've got here in the pandemic that autom automatically changes the structure of your airport, yeah. How do you do that? At least with the digital twin, you can scenario test and you yeah. can play war games and that sort of thing. Yeah, which is exactly how that this sort of technology is is starting to be used, and 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 it will will help them to avoid the passing on of those costs for the new infrastructure that they're going to need to deploy uh, yeah. in a post COVID world. Interesting, the McLaren racing team. I noticed Richard, you were wearing a McLaren racing team. Uh, uh, COVID mask earlier, they also have a digital twin that's pretty cool of their car. So, so yeah. when I was a CIO, CIO at Air Services, we worked with uh, Deloitte and McLaren uh, Racing Technology to build a digital twin of our airspace. Wow. It hasn't been deployed in, in a production sense. We've, uh, we've built the prototype uh, and we've proven that it works and, and Deloitte and McLaren were actually very uh, impressed with how quickly they could do that with their technology. Really? It's fantastic. Wow. Well, hey, Daniel Ricciardo won a race recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so, right. So, uh, go you, Daniel. Well done. Um, so, <laughs> let's. Uh, you know, actually, it's a good segue, really. Let's let's go a little bit off COVID for a bit into sort of airports. I've noticed it's one thing you do find when people talk about travel is they always seem to talk about the airport, right? You know, oh, look, you know, blah blah. Airport was fantastic. You know, um, this ha you know, this was amazing. That was amazing. I, I guess two questions. What is it about airports that people love? Why? Did, you know, isn't it a place you go to go somewhere else? And I guess my second question is, uh, you know, what in terms of a technology sense, what's standing out for you in mo in sort of modern airports? I'm not sure people actually do love going to airports, do they? Um, I, I find people always like to talk. Well, people always talk about, you know, I went to X airport and it looked amazing. Yeah, but I really yeah, hate ALA. Yeah, like the the <laughs> the, 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 the standout airports, the, you know, the ones that have really invested in in the architecture and the engineering uh, are definitely interesting places to visit. I think if you're a business traveller and, and you had to go there a lot, you, you yeah, probably don't. It would lose its luster pretty quickly. I in fact, there was some research done recently um, in the UK, uh, looking at uh, pre-COVID, looking at the, at the, at the you know, airline and, uh, and airport experience. And the most stressful part for a passenger 
in terms of travel, getting from point A to point B, is getting to the airport. Oh, yes. It's yes, the transport absolutely. you have to get to, to the airport, which is, uh, has been a very big, big challenge for airports because they don't control a lot of that, that infrastructure. They don't control a lot of the, the interruptions mm. that, that, that create that stress. Um, I guess if, you know... It used to shock me that you'd have to take a 40-minute cab ride from, you know, Sydney CBD or you know, nearby to Sydney Airport. Yeah. Like that would just, you know, and that was, you know, to take an eight-hour flight to Asia, it seemed yeah. crazy. Whereas, you know, in Asia, you just jump on a train and you're there. Yeah, it you depends on where you are in Asia. And, you know, it depends, it, it, sure, it depends. In the modern Asian cities, I should say. Well, yeah, you spend a lot of time in India and... Uh, Different scenario. <laughs> and I, I spent five hours in a taxi getting to the airport, so... Oh, I remember as a child traveling through Bombay Airport. It was not one of my uh, favorite experiences. Yeah. I remember. But, you know, I mean, I think some of the airports that have really struggled me, that Shanghai, what they've done there with that sort of big dome in the middle of it is extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is an yeah. extraordinary airport uh, architecturally. Uh, you know, I, I come back to the Doha uh, uh, Harman Airport is a, is an architectural um, uh, marvel, mm. and they've really they've, the engineering that's gone into that airport. They've really done a great job to blend the physical infrastructure of the airport with the digital, and so it's very non-invasive for a passenger. But a, but a passenger is is guided through that airport. Um, in, in a way that you, you don't even see the technology, you don't really, you feel it's the actual architecture of the building that's helping you navigate through the airport. And mm. I think that's a, a really fantastic example of, a, of an airport using technology in an intelligent way. And I can't ever sort of go past uh, Changi. I mean, Changi oh, yeah, is, my, is my favourite airport. And the, the, the Singaporeans are, are credited with coining the, the term aerotropolis which is an urban form that, that, that kind of mm. has the airport at the centre that drives the economic the With the economics, industrial base around. With the yeah. industrial base around and, and that sort of thing. And they've just driven that, that, that sort of model really, really well. And Changi Airport, for me, is the most stress-free environment. And I never have a bad experience in Changi. I never ever feel crowded in Changi. Mm. Um, and the bags are always on time. You know, the process through immigration or emigration is always seamless and, and simple, even though they, they haven't really got their biometrics working yet, um, which is just being implemented now. Um, and the other one, I, I think that I, my, my other favorite airport of mine is, is Hong Kong mm. for a very similar reason. You know, it's a, it's a airport city uh, and they've done a lot of work to invest um, in the way the technology integrates seamlessly with the physical infrastructure. Of the I love that you could check your bag in at the station and it would arrive in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, at the train station. Yeah. Like the airport express. And that was well ahead of its time. Right? What was, was fantastic. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the, the Hong Kong uh, airport authority is doing some really fantastic stuff at the moment in terms of uh, um, you know, m maintaining health standards. They've implemented a... Um, uh, a channel, and they're only using it for staff at the moment, but they think that they'll use it for passengers in the future, which which sterilises um, uh, as you as you walk down. It, it uses ultraviolet light to sterilise people, and so they use it for their staff oh, wow. that are working in the airport environment to make sure that they're um, that they're, uh, they're you know they're clean and, and it's hygienic. The other really in innovative thing I've seen there at, at Hong Kong is they're using robots to do cleaning. So the ro little robots oh, wow. go around, they yeah. clean the toilets, they clean all the public areas, they sterilise everything using ultraviolet and and air purifiers and things. And I think that's a really really clever innovative use of technology in an airport uh, context. Well, it's, again, it, it changes your whole personnel dynamics as well, right? Yeah. If you're, you know, because again, airport security, airport hygiene. Yeah, you can go on and on. I think that's uh, for me. Hong Kong and Sydney were my two favourite airports because they were both home. Yeah, my parents were there, and you know I lived here, yeah. so they were always my favourite. Yeah, no, Sydney's always great to come home to. That's I, mu I must say though, with Changi, the airport economics are fascinating in the sense that they pioneered, and I think the, the the Hong Kong Chinese did as well. The fact that you should be entertained at the airport while you are there, so you can do some shopping, you can visit some type of tourism attractivity. Like they've got that sort of garden upstairs that you yeah. can go to. There's a video game center. There's a, yeah. It's a very interactive sort of area. It's an experience. You will, it's an experience. That's the word I was looking for, right? Um, it's not a place, it's not like an airport, like I will use Bombay again, which is not, an, it, it's a different type of experience, a very different reason. Um, it is a, and I think that the economics of the airport have become fanc fascinating 
and the technology overlay of that becomes fascinating as well in terms of well if the airport's an experience and you're being it's designed to be attracted to um, then how do you manage that in a post-pandemic world I think is fascinating I want to go back quickly to one thing we were talking about earlier which was and you mentioned it and I said I'd come back to it was if it's really advanced on one side and not advanced on the other then you end up with this sort of global inequity really don't you you yeah. have a situation where <coughs> you know you're safe and secure you're completely sterilized you know you biometrically secured and then you arrive somewhere else where you're back to your paper passport and you know manual temperature checking do you think that creates some type of global inequity there is is there a problem with that is that a problem it's been a problem for the industry since its inception um, and it, it's difficult it's an, because it's a it depends on nations being at a level of interoperability from a technology perspective and, and a process and training perspective there are three uh, primary um, uh, committees or, or organisations that, that oversee this. Uh, the first one is um, uh, uh, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organisation, which is a subcommittee of the United Nations, ICAO. And ICAO sort of governs, it's not a regulator, um, and, it, and it doesn't overrule national sovereign um, rules and regulations but they try to uh, manage the harmonisation of uh, air traffic across, uh, across the globe. They try to make sure that everybody's at a, at a, at a level um, where uh, air transportation can be safe and reliable. Uh, and that often means uh, having a level of interoperability and technical capability that, that poorer nations struggle with. And they have a, um, uh, an initiative called No Country left behind and that means that the way that they're driving the technology innovation and the technology development uh, for aviation is ensuring that uh, poorer nations can can be uh, brought along that journey and that interoperability uh, isn't impacted by their their level of investment that those poorer nations can make now the problem is that causes a lag because the advanced nations are, 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 are able to invest in modern uh, advanced technologies much quicker than the poorer nations and mm. it takes a while to, for that to catch up. So that lag does generate a bit of an issue. The, the second um, uh, organisation that's involved here is uh, the International Aviation Trans uh, Air Transportation um, uh, organisation, IATA, and they represent the airlines. And, mm. and what they do is they try to ensure that each of the, 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 na the national states don't implement regulations and rules that, that, that penalise the airlines and, and, and they work with the airports and, and ICAO uh, as well. And the third one is the um, Airport Council International, uh, ACI, and they represent the airports and the airport interests. And they work with ICAO and IATA and, and other you know, governments, et cetera, to, make, to try and harmonise the way um, the rules work and, and so that we've got a fairly good chance that if you're departing an airport in Australia and landing in an airport somewhere in Asia or Europe or the US, that that experience will be, will be relatively similar. Um, and they, they do that by negotiating with the various parties and stakeholders in the aviation industry to try and harmonise those processes. Wow. It's an imperfect system, yeah. um, but it's definitely uh, a focus for the industry and they've been trying to get this. Well, now that you mention it, though, it is a pretty similar experience at the moment on each side. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there are differences, obviously, but there is a similar experience. You go through, you know, you know what to expect, right? Yeah. You turn up, you check in, you go through airport security, you're scanned, you're patted down, you're whatever, and then you know you get on plane and leave, right? Yep. That's pretty standardised, yep. right? Yep. So I didn't realise that there was that much, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that there's that much infrastructure behind it. Yeah, so you yeah, think so that will get us through this next phase? It, so, so they're very focused on it. Those three organisations have, co if you go to their website, the big COVID banner appears on every single <laughs> one of them. Yeah. They are very focused on this because uh, going back to the original comments we made about the industry, it's 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 making a, a massive loss. It's had, it's probably the most impacted interest industry by COVID. By a long so way. those uh, representative organisations are very very focused on making sure that that we come out of this crisis 
and the airline industry can recover as quickly as possible with the, with the greatest chance of um, returning to some sort of profitability. Here, here. I think we'd love to see it. I mean, the amount of airlines that have gone through bailouts and, you know, I noticed Lufthansa just did a cap raising the yep. other day. Cathay Pacific has done one. You know, it's, it is just a very, very difficult time for, for everybody in the aviation industry. And uh, look, uh, most industries have suffered by it, but you'd have to say being grounded by a health pandemic uh, for anyone in the sort of tourism, airport, airline sector has been difficult. It's been a fascinating conversation. We'll have to end soon. Yep. Um, but uh, normally I, I sort of like to say, well, you know, what are three things you think are going to happen? So I'm going to ask you to predict. So we're coming out of the pandemic. In order for us to really do this properly and make sure that we come back as an industry from an infrastructure and aviation perspective, what are three things you think we need to do? So the, one of the first things is we have to get our, uh, the biometrics working in a global perspective. There's no, it's not going to work very well if you can be biometrically um, efficient in your home airport and then have to get out your paper passport and your paper documentation at the arriving airport. So IATA is doing a lot of work in that area um, on an initiative called One ID, which, which includes biometric uh, uh, facial recognition, matching with I identities and vaccination status in a single uh, single product. So I think that's a very and interesting... And vaccination status. Yes. Interesting. And, and they're working with all nations. So they're, 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 they're going to implement a system that will that will work with all of, their, all of the nations, uh, the 193 yeah. nations that, that are... It's going to uh, bring in vaccine recognition, isn't it? it? That's going to be fascinating. It's going to be fascinating. And, and if, you, if you don't have a vaccine, then you're going to have to have some sort of test status. Mm. So this system oh, will okay. allow so that. So you might so be tested as negative. Yes. That might be right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that, I think that's the, the, the biggest one. The second one, I think, is is that experience that a customer will, experience, will have in the airport where they won't be touching things. They will have uh, a fairly um, seamless and frictionless flow through an airport. And that, that has to happen because we, we've got to make sure that um, you know, we're compliant to the various uh, health regulations and rules, etc., uh, and 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 try to give them that experience where uh, you know they they and build their confidence that they can come to an airport, leave an airport, and arrive at another airport and have that uh, a similar experience and be safe and feel and, safe and feel safe yeah, I mean, that's and, a big one, and, and secure. Yeah, that. and I think then the third one is to the discussion we had before about the economics of all this, this is all going to cost money uh, and the airports need to start to invest in, in some of these new technologies that allow them to operate much more efficiently uh, and, and not pass as much of this cost on to, to, the, to, the, to the flying passengers because you know, at the end of the day that, that constrains the demand and, and, and has a, a flow on impact to the industry as well. So I think they're the three things, the, the biometrics, the contactless and, and the operational efficiency are the sort of things that we'll see happening in airports in the, in the next you know, few years. Well, I, I think that's a fantastic summary of where we're at and I think um, you know, it's been a great time to be talking about this as we get ready to open up and start traveling again. Chris Seller, thank you so much for being part of the Smarter Cities podcast. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me.